Hey guys, and welcome to creating a cobblestone ground floor and substance designer video tutorial. My name is Javier Perez, and I'll be instructor through this course. A little bit about myself, I've been in the industry about 10 years now, and I'm currently the lead material artist at PlayStation Studios Visual Arts. In this lesson, we'll be going over the graph from start to finish and covering techniques, thought processes, and general understanding of how the material was made. I hope you enjoy this one and look forward to sharing my experiences with you. So let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start a brand new substance file and name it accordingly. I'm going to make sure I save that to my desktop or wherever, just in case if substance crashes, I'll at least have some auto saves um, that can always help with any of my lost work. Um, to begin with our forest ground, I'm actually going to start with um, a couple different noises, uh, preferably the clouds too. And this is where I basically start connecting all my outputs. So I basically want to see what we have going on the 3D viewport. I make sure to connect my normal, my ambient occlusion, and my height, just so we can get a sense of what's going on in the scene before continuing anymore. Um, I make sure to expand it or scale it twice, just so we can get a little bit more variation in the dirt. Once this happens though, I do notice that it tiles, so I make sure to throw in a make tile photo grayscale just to break that up and get our tiling back um, so we don't have those crazy seams in there. I then take a blur high quality grayscale and then just warp it so we could get some variation. Continuing forward, I'm still looking to get some more variation within the dirt. So again, I'm utilizing some more clouds and the same methods that I did with the original shapes. I'm just going in with the transforms and scaling it um, up by two. And again, here I'm just playing with the make uh, it tile photo grayscale so we could bring back the tiling because once we scaled it up, it actually broke the tiling and this is just bringing it back. I'm looking for some more interesting shapes in the form, so um, this actually helps me get some larger sweeps in there that I'm looking for. To end it off, I just add a sharpen, and then I'm going to just encompass that in a frame so we keep our graph nice and clean and name it Initial Mud. Next up, uh, I'm gonna add some other forms into this Initial Mud. I'm looking for some directional almost sweeps across the surface. So for that, I'm gonna take a Perlin noise, the one same kind of noise that we've been using in the beginning. I'm just gonna run it through uh, different levels, some multi-directional warp grayscales, and some slope blur so we can get some interesting shapes here. Again, I always add a blur at the end just to get it a little bit softer so the, the shapes aren't as aggressive. And here I'm just blending it into my original dirt. I'm messing with the 3D viewport to kind of see what we're getting and I'm liking the shapes that are coming out through here. Again, continuing to frame everything and naming it accordingly. Next up, um, I'm going to add a second directional mud here. Same kind of properties that we did with the original. I'm just doing a Perlin noise, a directional warp grayscale, and I'm blending it on top. Uh, you'll notice here that we're starting to get a little bit larger forms here and it's just helping us break up the surface. Continuing with that, I'm taking that exact same output and I'm doing a slope blur into itself. We start getting this really cool stepping effect on some of the areas of the dirt. Um, I don't really like how aggressive it is, so I, I made sure to add a histogram range and then blend it into itself. That way it gives me a little bit more control and I can mess with the opacity if needed. I go ahead and move my outputs just so I could have a little bit more space here. Continuing on, I'm going to do some larger sweeps. Again, it's more or less you'll kind of get the sense I'm doing the same things over and over again in almost a layered fashion. I'm doing the same Perlin noise, multi-directional warp, and then blending that into itself. Uh, I change the scale every time just so we could get larger forms and uh, just get some more interesting form factor into the actual dirt. Again, uh, this is where I'm actually adding a little bit more gran granularity into it. Um, I get a moisture noise, which is a little bit more, has a little bit more noise to it. So we're not necessarily focusing on the larger shapes now. We're getting more into just the finer details here. Um, I don't want to plug that in directly and blend it on top. So I'm actually grabbing our last blend and I'm running it through a few different filters. 
histogram selects a few clouds and using that to create a mask that will be used with our blend in no opacity. That way it's not being blended all evenly across the surface. There's some areas that are more opaque than others. Making sure to frame everything and continuing on. Again, here is another surface noise variation. Same sort of deal. Um, I am just changing the actual noise that's being applied to this. Um, I like having different variations of my noise when I'm actually creating materials. So I don't necessarily like using the same one uh, here. Same kind of idea where I'm grabbing our last blend and I am actually adding a nice noise on top of it. What I wanted to do here was I had some hot spots previously that were pure white that didn't have any sort of noise. Uh, you can kind of see there how it went from this flat white into having a little bit of more grayscale variation in there. Once I'm happy with just how the forms are working on the dirt, it's time to start adding some pebbles onto the surface. So to start off with my pebbles, I'm actually going to use a cube 3D and I'm going to get a few different of these stones that way they're either rotated or scaled differently and then I'm going to actually plug them into a tile sampler here. So here I'm just messing with some of the scaling and making sure they all feel a little bit different so they're not all the same sort of stone that are going to be applied everywhere. Just trying to get some sort of variation here. Cool. This is where I'm actually plugging in the tile sampler. And I'm going to use the pattern input and change the pattern input amount to three because that's how many variations we made here. And here I'm just going in through the parameters and changing a few things, trying to get more um, irregularity to them, just more randomness to them, some random rotation, a little bit of random scale, and just making them feel a little bit different here. Next up, um, I like the shape, but they're a little bit too cube-like. So I'm going in with another shape and I'm just going to overlay it on top of it to get it a little bit more rounder. You can kind of see the before and after there. Next up, I'm going to just clamp that grayscale, and this is where we're starting to get our actual rock shapes appear. Uh, I do an auto levels to get the blacks in there, and then we actually have our rocks now. Here, I'm trying to get a little bit more unique elements into these guys, so I'm going with a gradient and then leveling this out just so we could blend it on top and break up these surfaces a little bit more messing with the levels here, trying to find something that I know will break these up in a nice way. Cool. Once I get that, I'm actually going to use a threshold so I can get a mask out of this. Uh, eventually this mask will be used to overlay things on top of them while only affecting the rocks. Uh, I throw in auto levels just so the levels of the rocks will be, you know, um, just in a good value range. And then I add a bevel with that mass that I just created and blend it on top of our rocks. We get a little softer edge on it. That way the normal map reads a little bit better here. Uh, I love using the flood fill, so I actually added a flood fill to random gradient to just get some sort of regularity into the actual angles of the rocks. Next up, I'm trying to add a little bit more of um, just some finer details and some finer, I guess, undulation here. So this is where I'm taking uh, clouds and then running it through um, a warp so that the rocks get a slightly warped here, changing the scale of that actual clouds and then just blurring it slightly so it's not as intense once I actually plug it into the warp. And you can see the before and after we get like some sharper cuts into some just more undulation in there. Next up, uh, I want to add some cuts into these rocks. So I'm going to do that by using a cells and then just doing a slow blur grayscale with the clouds to break up that proceduralness of the actual cells. So we get something that's a little bit more broken up. And I'm going to use the rocks output as a directional warp input just so the the cracks know exactly where to go, and I'm gonna blend it on top of each other. I'm going back and grabbing that mass I created earlier. That way those cracks only affect the rocks that are being applied there. Once I have all four rocks, I'm actually going to use a crop grayscale and um, individually select each rock. This way, now that we have these four rocks, we can actually plug this guy into a shape splatter and uh, we can splatter all over the material. 
So here I'm actually changing a little bit of the sizing here. Um, once I had all that stuff cropped out, I still wanted to edit the rocks just slightly. That way they get a little bit more uniqueness to them and they change shape a little bit. So I'm just scaling them in and out um, to a shape that I'm, I'm liking here. Again, framing everything and making sure everything is nice and clean. So next up, this is actually where I'm going to add the shape splatter. The shape splatter is similar to the tile sampler, except it actually takes into consideration all the different forms within your material. So this is actually going to work really well because we have those nice big swoops of dirt. We have the nice, um, more granular dirt looking stuff. So it's going to almost overlay around the material, but also rotate and scale in a sense that makes, um, in a way that makes sense for your material. So the rocks are kind of going to, they're going to feel like they have been there for a while and they're not just going to be laid on top of them, like all randomly here. Um, I'm just messing with a few of the parameters here to try to get something I like. Um, so here we go. We start getting them all over the place. And they kind of feel a little, they kind of feel pretty good right there, but I'm just not liking how many are actually there. So I'm going down at the very bottom where the masking is happening and I'm just uh, bumping that up a little bit. So we get some of those just hidden ever so slightly again, going into my normal map and we can kind of see the forms and everything. I always like looking at the normal map to make sure we're going in the right direction here. Cool. What I do next is I'm actually going to take that exact same shape splatter. Um, with the connected output so same rocks and same almost ideas and principles but i'm almost just changing the output number so we get something that's a little bit more granular so um the ones before are are pretty small but i'm actually going even smaller for this guy so i'm just messing with some of the parameters here and i'm going to be plugging this guy in so we can kind of see what we got going on so right there we kind of see the difference there. Our our sand is getting super, or sorry, our dirt is getting super more grainy here. And this is kind of the effect we were looking for. I just wanted the dirt to feel a little bit more micro detailed when you get up close to it here. Again, making sure to frame everything and name it accordingly. That way our graph stays ni nice and organized. Next up, I like how the dirt is looking. I like how all the rocks or stones are kind of being blended on top of it, but I want a little bit of more breakup to the surface. So here I'm actually going to create almost, there's this smaller graph within this bigger graph here. So this is a completely different node network. You can always save into your other graphs if you need to. But what I'm looking here is more or less taking the same principles that we have been using with the stones and everything. And I'm just basically trying to find a shape that I will eventually tile and then overlay on top of my current mud or dirt that'll um, give it some nice surface breakup. So here I'm kind of just thinking I'm looking for more of a square, almost oval shape. And I'm just adding a bunch of different noises that'll break this up a little bit. Um, the reason being is because once I tile it, I want it to just feel different with every single stone that's being tiled, if that makes sense. Um, so here I'm just adding some slow blurs, some purlin noises, and just getting a nice breakup within the edges. Um, again, some more directional warps. I like using warps and directional warps. Uh, being careful with directional warps might push it a little bit off center of the actual image here. So make sure to mess with the intensity and don't go too intense on it. Um, I like where this is going. I want some more directionality to it or some more directional noise to it. So I go in with the crystals because it has that more verticality to it. And I'm just going in and messing with it. One thing you'll notice is that I tend to do a lot of almost uh, edits to to a noise that I bring in. I don't necessarily like just leaving it as is a lot of the times, um, especially stuff that is very, I guess, noticeable to a, a basic substance user. So like, I wouldn't want someone that could tell like, oh, you're, you know, you're using um, crystal noise here or something like that. I always like uh, editing it and making it feel a little bit more unique. I think that's what helps break up the whole proceduralness of just substance designer in general. Again, here, some more breakup of the actual surface of this single shape and stone, doing some transforms. 
um, making sure it tiles. So every time I tile up or scale up one of these cloud noises, I notice that the the tiling breaks. So again, I'm constantly using that make it tile photo grayscale and making sure that we don't get any of those seam lines that'll actually break our material here. Bringing up the samples, the intensity, and just um, trying to get something that looks a little bit more interesting. Um, here, this is uh, where I'm actually going to add uh, some more breakup onto that actual shape. And I'm doing that with uh, Clouds 2, more same of the transformation, the make it tile. And then I'm doing a histogram scan here to clamp those values from the clouds to get almost a black and white mask. I do a blur because I don't want those black and white masks to be just very, the edges to be so harsh. I want a nice like blend or a nice um, offset to them. So that's why I get those, I add the blur so it just blends in a little bit better. I then take a slow blur with a different noise and then I'm getting those chipped edges around that new mass I created. And this is what I'm actually going to blend on top of that original shape that I have there. So here I'm just blending it, playing around with the opacity, see how much. And all that work, now that I've made that one single shape, this is where it's gonna more or less come into play finally. Um, this is where we're actually going to plug it into a tile sampler and tile it and change the randomness of it, the position, the scaling of it, just to help break it up. Um, and you can kind of see here, it's getting uh, pretty almost in the white value. But once we actually add some of the other noises moving forward, you're going to be able to see it a little bit better. So again, just trying to make something that's a little bit more random. It, it's kind of hard to tell, but essentially I'm using that one single like oval shape and I'm just tiling it all over the place to get something that's a little bit random and um, obscure there. I took that original noise that I used to overlay it and then I did another blend. And then here I'm doing a shadows to really push those forms. Uh, I like using the shadows and then using that as a mask to almost overlay and push the forms a little bit. I do that a lot of the times with like cliffs or anything like that. So I'm just using that same kind of um, method here once we have all that we can finally um, add some more noise here so we've been working on the larger forms for this um, so i'm just going to add some of that more grainy grainy stuff to it um, doing some blends again taking clouds doing some fractal sums and just blending it so we could get something a little bit different blending that with that new uh, mass that we created here and again just continuing on blending more noises and trying to get something that's a little bit more unique and doesn't feel as procedural here again uh, keep in mind we still actually haven't blended this to our original dirt here so again this is just more seeing the different shapes and the different valleys that are working here so this is actually where we're blending this in but before we blend it into our dirt again i'm using that same method where I do an invert grayscale and then the histogram scan. That way, this gives me a little bit control of where this new noise that I'm bringing in is being applied to. You can always go back and mess with the mask and kind of get different results. And here you see me looking at the results here. You go from having um, the dirt kind of being all over and the same almost granularity to it. But with that new noise mass I created, we get some nice almost chiseled chipping on some of the rock surfaces. I saw some of it in the reference that I was looking at. So I thought it was a cool little addition. Um, I know it's a lot for like this small little tidbit but you can always go back into the mask and change it like if you want it to show up a little bit more or all over the place here i'm actually grabbing the stones that we used earlier because i'm gonna re-add them again at different sizes here so i'm just grabbing the connection points and i'm actually going to do a little bit more variation to these so they don't feel exactly the same as they did before so what I'm doing here is I'm actually just doing a non-uniform uniform blur grayscale. It's similar to a blur, but it gives you a little bit more control of the fall off on the edges. So it's almost giving you some control of how soft and how bubbly these rock surfaces are going to look. Um, based on from what they were originally created, so when I originally authored them in the front to be used as these smaller pebbles, I wanted these larger surfaces for these guys. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding just a little bit more granularity to them 
I'm adding just a moisture noise and blending that on top of it. That way we get a little bit more um, surface detail on these rocks. And because I've also did that blur, it's almost going to be like a pillowy, but also we're going to have some more surface detail. So I wanted them basically to feel different from the original rocks that we tiled or stones that we tiled earlier um, while still using the same shape. So I'm basically, you know, um, I'm trying to find ways to continue to re reuse what I used previous, like in the beginning of the graph, just in a s like smarter way. I want them to just change a little bit, but still feel like they're from the same biome here. Um, here I, I'm doing the same thing, shape splatter, and I'm going through the different parameters to try to get something that's a little bit more unique. And you can kind of see the different results we're getting here just by messing with a few of the parameters. Just by looking at this, I'm sure you guys can get ideas of like cool different materials you can come up with here because this is looking cool in and of itself. Like if I needed to make a more rocky dirt ground or something with some softer stones or something. So might be a cool riverbed or something. But for this particular instance, I was just looking for a few of them um, scattered across. Um, it just felt a little bit more natural than have them all over the surface like that. So. I just went with a few and in the shape splatter I made sure to mess with the masking value there. Next up, this is where we are actually going to add our scans into the graph. Um, I've already had a folder on the side on my second monitor with a few different scans that I've downloaded from Substance Source that I'd like to use. Um, so here I'm actually using, um, uh, I think it's white grit, common white grit three and these are just small little pebbles i'm not using them straight out as they are um in a sense of i'm not using like the color maps and all that stuff quite yet i'm more so going to split these off that way i have a little bit more control of what i'm doing with these so for this instance because i am still working with the high information i'm basically going to split these out for a couple different variations using the atlas splitter and um, basically atlas splitter is just going to uh, take an atlas and you could choose and change the different settings to pinpoint which rock you're using here it's kind of more of a random sense uh, you could actually choose which one you want but i kind of just did random here um, but what i'm doing here is i'm just getting the height information for all these different scans and even though it's a scan, I still wanted to add a little bit of my own flair to them. So again, I'm doing the same moisture noise that I did on those previous rocks that I did earlier. So using the same method here, doing a blend with a threshold mass. That way the, the moisture noise only affects the rock and not the black background. So in a sense, this is like... Uh, a nice way of being able to use scans but still being able to you know use whatever substance tools that in, at your disposal to try to get some more variation you're not bound to just straight up using the scan as is and that's what i like about using substance to you know do any sort of materials with scanning work here using the sh uh, the same shape splatter that we've used previous i'm kind of just doing the same method and throughout the tutorial you'll notice that i kind of keep going back to the shape splatter because i do like the way it tiles and puts the actual objects across the surface so it just makes it feel a little bit more natural here here i plugged in the shape splatter a little early just so i can kind of see what's going on here and I'm kind of liking it, but there's a little bit too many rocks here. So I'm just going to bring up the mass random. One thing that I realized during this is I actually did want these scans to more or less show up around the exterior of the previous medium stones. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting some of the information from the previous shape splatter that I use those um, stones that I created. And what I'm doing here is I'm running through a different set of nodes. So flood filter, grayscale, blurring it, blending with itself. And what this is doing is it's going to give me a mask. And you'll notice that the white areas are basically surrounding the previous rocks I did. So when I plug it into the shape splatter, these smaller new scanned stones are actually just going to show up around the exterior of the scans or the stones that I previously did here. So I just wanted to make it feel a little bit more natural in a sense. So we got the larger shapes 
in the middle with the stones, but I wanted some surrounding smaller stones. You can kind of see it here as I'm looking at it in the normal. Um, it's kind of giving us a cool little effect here. So making sure to look at it in the OpenGL uh, 3D viewport, making sure everything is looking good. Same kind of idea here. I'm going in and this time I'm actually going to do some almost smaller stones here. So continuing on to do the exact same process I just did previously. Again, I'm just kind of running it through the same methods using the Atlas splitter the, from one of the Dirty Rock Pebbles 03 scans that I found. And for this guy, uh, I believe I did actually just plug it in straight into the shape splatter. I didn't do any edits uh, to this one too much just because I liked the forms it was giving me and I didn't feel like I needed to do too much. One other thing that I felt like I didn't really um, want to do too much is because I think in the end here, I actually only have them like scattered maybe one or three or three or something like I, I basically take down the masking pretty low here so it's only showing me like maybe one or two or three on the final material so I'm kind of just messing with the height values here they're they're feeling a little bit flat and that's because uh, I needed to mess with the height scale and the height offset so here this is actually looking pretty cool they're kind of almost dug deep into this um, dirt material but I still felt like they were too many for what I was looking for here so um, I'm gonna keep messing with some of these parameters and actually bring up the random scale and that's where you kind of see them going down to maybe like one or two that are showing up on the actual final material there again making sure to frame everything and looking at the 3d viewport and making sure everything is nice and neat continuing forward more of the scans uh pretty much this is same sort of method using uh, bringing in any sort of scan that i like and then using the atlas splitter to break that up in any way um, i like so this instance um we're done with any of the stone work as far as as far as adding it to the dirt. So I wanted a little bit more different details here. So I'm doing some twigs. Um, again, same kind of idea. Um, I'm gonna plug these guys into another shape splatter and I'm gonna mess with some of the values here. So they kind of just splatter all over the place. Um, the cool thing about these twigs is that I, even though the scan is uh, like, the name is twigs, I almost used them in a, in a in a sense that they were almost pine needles like they, they I ended up scaling them so small that they on the surface they just felt like more more or less like pine needles than anything else so it almost gave me that that feeling of like a forest ground or something really quickly um, here you can kind of see I've already scattered them all over the place and I'm just messing with the height and scale values to make sure they are aren't protruding too much again this is one of those instances where uh, I like how this was looking, but again, it was just too many um, for what I was looking for for the forest ground. So I'm actually going to mess with the mask random and make sure some of those are actually um, disappeared a little bit here. So again, you can always go back to any of these because the shape splatter is non-destructive. You can up the amount or, you know, take more away. I'm looking at the normal here and making sure everything is feeling good. Looking at different shapes just to kind of see how the lighting is affecting it. And this pretty much sums up your dirt material. So if you wanted to, you could actually more or less like make this a one off material and, you know, start creating um, different variations. But for this instance, as you saw in the renders, we're actually going to do a stone floor. So this is going to be the beginning of our stone floor. So to do that, we're just going to do a tile random to begin here. Uh, I'm just messing with some of the values to try to get something that's a little bit random here. So just moving the different shapes here. And this might seem a little weird and it's kind of just random. Like this doesn't really seem like you're doing anything. But once we actually bring in this distance node, you'll actually see what we got going on here. We're starting to get some of those really interesting rock effects here. Or sorry, stone shapes, if anything else. So I'm actually disconnecting the dirt here and I wanted to just straight up connect the this very basic forms that way we can kind of see 
what I'm actually doing with the hide information rather than just see you guys staring at the dirt the entire time. So I made uh, the decision to just plug this guy in and see what's going on as we're building the stone. So we won't necessarily see the dirt here. Um, we're basically just straight up working on the on the the stones um, by themselves. So um, basically what I'm doing here is I liked some of the values that I was getting for the different stone shapes, but some were coming out too dark and I just wanted to edit them ever so slightly. So basically ran it through a gradient map and colored a mass. That way I can pinpoint which specific stones I'm looking for and then do value adjustments that way. Um, plugging that in and then I'm going back with the original shapes and doing an edge detect here. This is where we're actually going to get those nice bevels, and this is where we're going to finally start seeing some of the actual stone shapes come into fruition here. So they, they'll start lo stop looking like those weird uh, panels that you see right now. Going to blend those on with itself and then lower the opacity, and now you can kind of see we're starting to get our basis of our stone shapes here. So making sure everything is framed and making sure everything is named accordingly. So throughout the process of actually creating these stones, we are going to use a lot of different flood fills and a lot of different variations to the flood fill. So I made sure to name this one main flood fill because I throughout the tutorial, you'll see me going back to this one quite frequently. And I want to make sure that this is the one I'm going back to. So one thing with the actual material in the end is that I didn't actually leave all the stones um, in the final material early on i wanted some of them to be almost like gone like they were not there it just felt a little bit more natural so here i'm using the flood fill to create a mask that i will eventually use to subtract from our current stones here that way we get a little randomness to where these stones are so some have stayed and the other ones looked like they were never there to begin with so you know storytelling um uh, more so than anything as if like you know over time the stones just either disappear chipped away or however you want um the cool thing about this though is that if you ever wanted to like bring back all the stones because substance again non-destructive you can always go back and change these valleys and you can actually just completely take off this specific portion and not use it so so here um, I'm using the flood fill to like the biggest advantage here is I love using the angle gradient. That way we get some nice, interesting, normal information out of it. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking that flood fill that I talked earlier about the main one and I'm running it through five. I believe, yeah, I believe it's five different uh, flood fill to gradients and I'm blending them all into each other. So once we blend them through min and min darken, you'll notice we start getting those cut planes on the actual shapes it almost gives it um i, I kind of describe it as almost like when you're cutting the planes off in zbrush or something like that uh once i have those shapes i do a levels and then i start breaking up the surface with some slope blur grayscales and we go from you know you can kind of see what's going on there um here you'll notice that i actually took that noise and lowered it as far as like the output size it just gives you a little bit more variation um, into the slope blur grayscale play around with the output sizes of your noises because you'll be you'll find out you'll get a lot more variation in that sense but once i blend that in you can kind of see what we went from we went from having those like pretty basic shapes and now we're starting to get some forms and some interesting rocky surface uh undulation there these next couple of slope blur grayscales are essentially just detailing of that we're taking the same slope blur grayscale and just breaking up the surface even more so so we're doing some edge breakups we're doing some micro edge breakups and some undulation i thought this one was extra cool we got those nice striations almost on like the horizontal planes so again and that's because i took the clouds too and again messing with the output sizes here um, even though your material like final is a 2048 by 2048 always make sure to play around with these noises because they are going to give you different results at smaller output sizes so you're not always bound to like using a noise at a 2048 by 2048 or what um, whatever size you're working for again um, just going in messing with those values 
uh, here, uh, I'm pretty happy with the larger forms. So this is where I'm actually going to start bringing in some of the smaller surface noise. And it's a little bit similar to how we've already authored the dirt in a sense where I always like working with the larger forms and then slowly work my way into the medium and then the more uh, grainy or micro detailing here. Um, it's just easier to kind of see that um, just building up in a sense. So, you know, it's almost like working in Photoshop. You start with the bigger shapes and you're layering on more and more um, as you go forward. So I basically just did a cells, doing some slow blur grayscales and doing some transforms to break up the surface. Um, this next part is actually interesting because um, it, it was kind of like a happy accident. I basically got a flood fill and then I did a vector warp and these inputs were actually plugged in by accident, but I really liked the noise that it was giving me. It was nothing like I had ever seen really like when messing with substance. So. Um, here you can see me adding it and you kind of see that really weird shapes and noise. Um, but it added so much surface that I just liked how it ended up turning out, but I did lower the opacity cause it was a little strong, but it was that it was one of those instances of just like substance designer, just plugging in and seeing the different things that'll happen. Just happy little accidents. Um, quoting Bob Ross there. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to find a lot of the times there's been instances where, um, I plug something in random that I don't think will end up working out for my graph, but it, it somehow gives me something that's completely unique, um, essentially. So that was just one of those instances there. Uh, but here's actually me doing what I actually wanted to do. I want to do a vector warp grayscale just so I can move and shift the actual noise around here a little bit. So I'm going in doing an invert grayscale after I've shifted the noise depending on the tile. So vector warp grayscale takes into account where the shape is, but it breaks up your noise. So what I don't want essentially is whenever I plug in a noise, I don't want it to go from side, basically continue from one tile to another. I want it to be a little bit more unique and almost feel more organic in a sense. So each tile feels a little bit different. Um, taking those surface noises and making sure it's all clean and I frame it and I name it accordingly here. Cool. So what I'm doing here is I'm just using that same method that I talked about earlier with the shadows and I'm just doing an invert and this is where I exaggerate some of those shapes. You can kind of see I plug it in uh, before and after just so you can kind of see what the shapes are doing. Um, so we're getting some interesting shapes here. Some of the planes, you'll notice that I have a little bit of those um, high planes here. So I'm trying to find ways to break that up. And uh, this is one of those ins instances of like taking something you've already done and just messing with it a little bit to try to get something else. So that shadow mask that I just created, I basically ran it through a safe transform grayscale and I rotated it slightly. I'm running it through a histogram doing a slope blur to break up those edges. And this is essentially gonna be used at some cracks. So once I have those nice shapes, I'm gonna just blend it on top of it, add a subtract and you can kind of see, we start getting those nice little chips there. Uh, make sure it's framed and uh, named accordingly. So I'm happy with everything I've done so far, but I am doing a levels here just so some of those white peaks aren't as um, intense. So we're, when working with high information, a lot of the times um, I tell my students, you know, don't go to the max of black or white. That way you can still have the ability to add certain things. So whenever you have a white value in your height map, you're essentially telling it like this is the topmost height. So when you go into blend modes and you try to set something on add, it's actually not going to add it because you've already maxed out the peak white value on that. So just something to note. Always make sure to work in your grayscales and try to, you know, auto levels or add a levels to bring those tones down ever so slightly. Here I am actually adding some stone scratches by using a substances uh, scratch generator. Uh, I tend to use a scratch generator a lot when working on hard surface stuff, but 
uh, it's always fun to use it on stone surfaces. Um, you can always mess with the distortion and mess with the intensity. So you can kind of see there, I bumped it up just slightly just so I can kind of see what's going on there. But um, I made sure to lower the intensity so it doesn't feel too uh, weird there. Cool. So next up, I'm going to add some pitting to these. So we've worked on a lot of, again, just more directional noise, surface noise, but um, Based on the reference I was looking at, there were some almost small little crevices and pitting on these actual stones. So I'm taking a dirt and I'm scaling it up and I'm just doing a levels and then running that through a tile generator. So I'm getting even more, I'm basically tiling it way more, but with the tile generator, I at least have a little bit more control as to like changing the grayscale value of it or changing the rotation of it. So I get a little bit more variation, kind of see my, uh, me zooming in there and seeing what we get there. Uh, one thing to know is I did add a bevel just because I didn't want those pitting to be such sharp edges and it just gives it just a softer little um, bevel to the normal map just reads it a little bit better when you have just softer edges there. So that's why I did that there. Continuing on, this is where we're starting to gonna, we're going to start to get a little bit more detail here because I'm actually starting to add more of the surface noise. So similar to how in the dirt, we, again, we talked about the large forms. This is me going in and adding the moisture noise, messing with some of the valleys there and then leveling and then blending into itself. So you can kind of see we're starting to get a lot more surface noise on these actual stones. And from here on, I, I'm just going to continue with that trend. So I'm actually getting some more noise and, but doing some more directionality to it. So, um, basically trying to find ways to add more surface noise, but in more unique and interesting ways. Here I'm just messing with a few different values, making sure everything is framed and named accordingly. So here I'm just moving everything out of the way and looking at the whole stone. I'm moving it out of the way just because I know eventually I'm going to add it on onto the dirt. So I'm just preparing myself for that, keeping the graph nice and organized. Um, so these specific noises that I'm gonna be adding next are actually i call them unique only because um for these guys um i don't actually apply them across the whole surface uh, i'm actually going to go back to those flood fields that we discussed earlier and try to and try to get mass out of them that way the these specific noises are only going to be applied to certain random stones throughout the material so here you can see i'm going back and trying to find which flood fill i want to use and i'm just going to use a flood fill to random grayscale and i'm just going to make a mask out of that so i'm just going to Grab that and then use my histogram select so I can make a black and white mask and then just blurring it ever so slightly. And then this is basically going to you, you'll notice right there the, the noise is only applied to one of those stones. So the nice thing about the histogram select is that I can go back and change the range of it if I want to apply it to more. But the purpose of these noises are, again, just make some of them feel unique and different from all the rest of the stones. So. I'm doing the same thing here again with a different surface noise. So I believe earlier it was just fractal sum with levels here. I'm just doing a fractal sum two with a high pass grayscale, giving me a little bit different variation, but still feels like it's coming from the same um, family. So again, same kind of method here. I'm going back and looking at the flood fill and trying to see if I can create another mask out of this one. So on this guy, um, I did end up just grabbing the flood fill and creating a new mask. Um, something that works for this specific noise here. Cool. Just making sure everything is nice and organized. And there we can see, once I plugged it in, you can kind of see which ones it's um, gravitating towards. But already, like th this one in particular, it, it definitely made, you could definitely feel, once you look at the material, like some of those stones have a little bit more graininess to the other ones. And I think that's what I like about this because all the stones are starting to feel, they have the same large shapes. But I think with the, the smaller micro detailing, it's where you get a lot of the uniqueness and uh, separation in those elements. 
So taking the same idea here um, from when we added the pitting, I'm kind of basically doing the same thing. But for these guys, I wanted some larger pits. So I wanted almost like larger cutouts. Same kind of scenario where I, I still want them to feel like um, they're little speckles on the actual stones. But I do want them like you can see here almost looks like grated cheese. But I just did, wanted them to be a little bit bigger. Um, and again, I made sure to lower the opacity so it's not as intense here. Always looking at the normal map to see what kind of information we're getting here. And again here, I'm just going to do some more uh, pitting here to the rocks. But again, I'm doing the whole unique. So it's only going to be applied to a few of these stones based on the flood fill that I am using here. This time I did something a little bit different. Um, I ran these uh, noise and shapes through a flood fill mapper. Um, this this kind of just gave me a little bit more variation to how to use these noises and how they are applied to the surface. So I could actually plug in the flood fill directly to this one and kind of control the rotation and the actual strength of the noise. And here you can kind of see me just uh, messing with the opacity so it doesn't uh, come out too strong on there cool just circling the material here making sure everything is all good so one thing throughout the whole stone creation that I was missing I felt like were um, based on the reference I was looking at a lot of the times were a lot of these stones felt like they were cut almost in a sense of layering so almost like some of them were some of the pieces were chunked off if that makes sense um so like if there was like a nice clean cut on one of these rocks you'll notice just by staring here uh directly on the on the 3d viewport um a lot of them feel like they're on the same plane we do have some almost angle variations but i wanted some of the rocks to feel like um over time they were just broken off so here I'm actually going to begin the process of creating a brand new it's all, again similar to how we were creating the smaller graph to break up the dirt this is one of those instances of creating another smaller utility graph that I will eventually be adding onto our main stone shape so what I'm doing here is I basically took a shape uh, a square shape and run it through some different um, gradients and different noise just so we can get a nice breakup um, you'll start seeing that I'm using the same methods that I did when I was creating that um, dirt breakup in that one shape I'm putting all my efforts into creating this one specific shape because I know down the line I'm going to tile it and that's how we're gonna get our nice surface breakup um, if any of you guys seen my previous tutorials um, this is the exact same method that I used to create one of my cliff materials. Um, so it's a nice way to get like larger forms. Um, and I just felt like if I did it this way, it'll be really easy to cut into those uh, stone slabs later on. So similar to how we were creating that stuff for the dirt is I'm taking that shape and I'm just running it through different Perlin noises, different directional noises, um, messing with different um, angles just trying to get a nice breakup of this one specific shape because i know it's going to be tiled like crazy so going in and just warping it adding some crystal noises um ever ever so subtly here trying to get some nice variation here and um yeah breaking this up a little bit changing some of those levels so here i'm adding some I guess more angled variation into this guy so uh, one thing that I like to do a lot of the times is you notice how I added that that almost directional noise onto it but I almost I blended it into itself again so I like that ability to blend it within itself because it gives me the option of messing with the opacity um, it just gives me a little bit control of how much strength I want on these cuts so it's a, it's a nice little trick there um, so you can control the opacity of that stuff. So here is we're actually going to um, do our tiling. Before we actually plug this into our um, splatter circular, uh, I took that last rock, but I just rotated it uh, 180. That way I get another variation. If you wanted to, you could do this variation like 
two or three times. So if you want to do like 190 degrees, 180, um, whatever you want. So the more variation you had into you add into the splatter circular, the more unique your shapes are going to come out to be. So just something to keep in mind. So I'm going to plug this in and you kind of see that this is starting to almost look like a cliff shape. Like I mentioned before, a uh, similar method that I use when I'm creating my cliff um, stuff and cliff demos. So uh, if you're wanting to learn more about that stuff, make sure to check those out. Cool. So now that I have this main shape, I'm actually going to bring our final stones, how they were previously. And this is where I'm going to do some blending here. So. I'm just gonna frame this, making sure everything is named accordingly. And then uh, I'm gonna bring in that blend and then I'm gonna just change the, um, I'm gonna change the opacity and blend mode. But first, um, similar to how we were choosing specifically where we wanted this noise, I'm doing the same sort of method here. Um, I wanted those cuts to only appear on certain rocks or just the opacity to be a little bit widespread between the stones. So with all these different gray valleys that I have here, those cuts are going to come in at different opacities. Um, so you kind of see it there and then I'm going to plug it in just to kind of see what we got going here. I added levels just so I can control that a little even more so. And there we go. So you can kind of see we had that. We had a little bit there. so. You know, went from that flatness and now we're starting to get a little bit more almost like war worn and tearing there onto those rocks so they're getting a little bit more compact and we're getting a little larger surface variation there so we're not done here we're actually going to use those exact same um, shapes that we plugged into that first shape splatter but we're just going to do a second variation again always like using the stuff we've created and try to plug them into different tile samplers, different shape splatters. It's okay to plug them into the same um, generator, but it's always cool to, you know, change the parameters and see what kind of different results you can get here. So here I'm just messing with a bunch of the different um, size values, the scale values, so we could get something that's a little bit more unique compared to the one we just created here. These values, um, I'm just sampling them from um, the finished graph. So again, feel free to play with these numbers. Um, you'll notice with these in particular, I kind of almost went for like a directional streaking on these. So it almost looks like um, like uh, semi-angled cuts or something like that. And we're going to get a better interpretation once we actually add it to the stones. So here I'm doing that method that I've talked throughout the tutorial is taking the shadows and then um, using that node to really push the values here. And you can kind of see what happened there is um, once I added those shadows, it really pushed in those forms a little bit. Um, I did a histogram range that way I could bring the values back and then I did a vector warp. So it changes the noise per stone there. So I just use one of the flood fill color maps and um, with the vector warp and then just moves it all over the place there. So here, this is where I'm actually blending this stuff in, kind of get a sense of what's going on. And I'm just going to go back into the beginning of our graph to get one of the masks that will be used when I actually blend this guy in here. So doing another flood fill. Blood photo gradient, and I'm just going to grab this and plug it all the way out there. So again, I just don't want it to plug in straight into these. I do always want to change the, um, the masking here. And you might ask yourself like, oh, why don't you just grab one of the, because I've been doing this throughout the tutorial is grabbing like flood fills, grabbing random gradients. Every time I create a random gradient um, flood fill, uh, I get different results. So that's why I always do different ones. And there you can actually see it plugged in. We start getting a lot more surface variation. Uh, it, it definitely doesn't feel like it's on the same plane. One thing to note here is I did want to add almost like a softness to these stones. So I did a non-uniform blur grayscale and, and then blend it into itself. So I'm messing with the opacity here, but you can kind of get a sense of the results you could get if you were to up the opacity a little bit there. So. Just something to try out with uh, your guys' um, materials here. 
So moving forward, uh, I want to push the idea of those almost uh, stacked cuts. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a flood fill uh, from earlier and I'm doing a levels and I'm just getting some random shapes. And these are actually going to be overlaid on top of our current stones. So they're going to they're going to feel like they've been stacked in a sense, but I'm trying to make them feel like they've been cut and I want to make them feel like um, they've been sitting on top of the actual stones this whole time, but over time they've just either been used up or worn or, you know, just natural cuts within the organic surfaces here. So here I'm just creating some different shapes um, and trying to get something that works. I'm doing a bunch of different um, blends and blurs and slope blurs try to get some breakup onto the surface of those cuts because once i add them um, i want them to feel like they're coming from the same plane or um, the same the same stone but different planes if that makes sense so here once i add those in you can kind of see what's going on here um it looks like they've been on like i'm liking some of these cuts here but i do notice that like that looks pretty cool here i do notice that if i push it too much it, it'll start getting a little weird so I try to find an opacity that works for what I'm going for. And then I just do a frame and look over my normal and make sure it's all looking good. So I would say we're almost done with the rock forms. I just wanted to add one final thing uh, because down the line, I knew I wanted to add moss over this, this specific material. Um, I wanted to add, uh, I think it's lichen on these guys. So, um, I'm just going to do a grunge map here and I'm going to run it through a tile generator and I'm just messing with the different results here. Just trying to find some values that'll work here, um, uh, messing with the X and Y's. Um, I'm basically taking that grunge and using the tile generator to break it up and make it feel a little bit more random. Once I find the mass that I like, I do a blur and, um, I do a grunge on top of it to subtract some of it away so it's not all uniform um, I use just a different grunge to break that up slightly so here I've done this method before in some past tutorials on how to overlay things to feel like they've been compressed onto the surface so what I'm doing with the lichen here um, I'm plugging that into a mask but I'm blurring the material into itself so wherever the lichen is going to be finally added it's actually doing a pre blurred there that way, when I do the blend mode on an add, it just overlays nice and evenly on top of the surface and we won't get any weird artifacting there. So it's a nice way uh, to add different elements. So you could use that for leaves or anything like that. But um, yeah, I do that quite a bit there. And now um, the moment you all been waiting for here, um, we've gone ahead and finished pretty much all the stone tiles here. So I'm just moving it out of the way. And I'm plugging the stones on top and I'm grabbing my final output for the dirt and I'm plugging it into a height blend. So height blend is really nice because it's going to take both elements, going to take into consideration all your different values. And it's going to naturally blend them together based on the different values that you've um, created throughout the entire material. So just going through here, making sure everything looks good. So we got a nice breakup of dirt. We got an, um, some of the dirt is bleeding onto to the stone tiles, which is really nice. And this is the, the great way of, um, you know, the non-destructiveness uh, that I was talking to you about earlier. Um, so I like the, I liked how everything was looking, but I, I just wanted a different sort of layout with these stones. So what I did was go all the way to the very beginning of where we did our distance work on our stones and just broke that up there. So getting right back into it, um, we're going to start integrating some more of our scans that um, we've been doing throughout this whole tutorial. So for this instance, we're going to do some grass clumping. Um, we've been doing a lot of the scanning stuff on the actual dirt. So um, I'm going to add these guys mostly on the dirt again, but I do want some of them to just trickle into um, being on top of the stone. So. Here I'm just splitting up like I usually did uh, earlier in the demo with the Atlas splitter. And I'm actually going in and plugging these guys into a shape splatter. So with this shape splatter in particular, um, usually I've kind of not messed too much with the masking, but because I want these to show up in particular 
on the dirt and now that we've added the stones i am going to have to grab one of the masks from the hype blend here so i'm actually just messing with the values here first so we can get something that is to my liking messing with the different height values um, conforming some of these to the shapes and this is where i'm actually grabbing a mass from the hype blend. So the other great thing about using a hype blend versus just a normal blend is that the hype blend is actually going to create a mass for you, which is really awesome because in the end, it actually helps you pinpoint certain areas that you want. So with this mask, it actually broke up like the white areas are where the stones are and then the black area is with where the dirt is. So this is going to come really in handy later on when we're doing our color pass as well. Cool, so once I have all the grass planes there, I wanted to add a little bit more detailing into the actual um, dirt there. Um, and I thought a great way would just be adding some roots, not necessarily roots above the ground, but I wanted to give the impression of like roots growing underneath the ground. So there's some sort of undulation and you almost see the silhouette of the roots, but just not completely um, going through the ground there. So I'm doing similar tricks that I did with the stones where I basically took a tile sampler and then a distance to get the shapes I'm looking for. I broke that up with a Perlin noise and then I'm going in with an edge detect here. The edge detect um, pretty much gives me those really interesting root looking shapes, but to make them feel a little bit more rounder, like actual tree roots, I use the non-uniform blur grayscale to give me those nice values there. I didn't want them to be too, I guess, procedural or uh, almost man-made looking. So I threw in a slope blur and just broke that up ever so slightly here. So again, I'm going to actually grab the mask that I uh, gra got earlier from the height blend. But I'm going to do the same sort of treatment that I did when I was using the lichen where I'm going to do a pre blur before I actually add in the roots here. So I'm actually doing a little bit of changes to the masking here. So the hype blend gave me like an overall mask, but I still wanted to pinpoint exactly where I wanted these roots. Um, I wasn't really liking the results I was getting where the roots were kind of going all over the place in a sense like um, they're going in some areas of the material I didn't want so that's why you saw me adding the black value and using some of the blend crop features to really pinpoint where I wanted these guys in here so again doing that pre blur that I talked to you about earlier uh, when adding the lichen uh, moss effect um, and then here I'm actually uh, doing the actual adding of it after doing the, the uh, pre blur here. So here just some more uh, blends and yeah, there we go. So um, the nice thing about this is I wasn't really happy with the way this was looking in a sense of I wasn't liking the pattern. So I'm going to actually go back to the beginning of the tile sampler and mess with the shapes of this. So uh, here you can kind of see me going into the random seed and the random seed gives me a bunch of different random variations. And that's the one I ended up going with. Um, each one's going to be a little bit different. So just play around with it. Um, cool. So making sure to frame everything again, keeping the graph nice and clean. So again, I'm going to keep adding a few more. I think this is the last actual scan that I used within the material. So now that I had the roots, um, I wanted to give the impression of what I was talking about a little bit earlier was some of the roots growing out. So I got this again, substance source scan of a tree stump and I'm going to use the height mask that I created earlier and using some of the newer masks that I use the blend crop features. And I'm going to be plugging this into the shape splatter. With this one in particular, um, I only split one of the roots because I honestly, I think similar to how the stones were, um, the larger stones at the beginning where I only did like one or two or something. Um, I This one, I just got one shape and um, used it only like twice throughout the material. 
So here I actually end up with an issue here that uh, you'll notice that I keep playing and messing with some of the valleys, but it won't go away. Um, it was actually my bad. The the uh, instead of plugging in the height map twice, I accidentally grabbed the opacity mask. So you'll notice that some of the roots just keep coming out really, really flat. It's not until like after I've messed with some of these valleys that they um, I realized what was going on. So one thing to note, even though that, oh, I guess this is where I actually figured it out here. Uh, one thing to note was um, there were too many of the roots popping up where um, I didn't want them to. So between some of the cracks and not necessarily in the area where I wanted them to be. So I basically wanted the roots to only show up around, um, or sorry, the stumps to only show up around the roots. So this is me going in and adding a black value and using some of the blend crop features to again, pinpoint where exactly I wanted these to show up. So there, that's pretty much um, the one, I think it's like one of the few scans that only used one in there. So I wanted to give the impression of now that the roots are there, there's actually some stumps that are protruding out right next to the tree roots. So cool. Uh, again, going in, making sure everything is named correctly and framing everything. And this is where we're going to begin our color information. So we got all of our high uh, information. We got everything blended in. So let's start to add color to this guy. So. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding color to the overall stones. Um, I'm going to pinpoint the stones first and then move on to the dirt. So whenever I start my color pass, I use the ambient occlusion and the high pass grayscale almost as utilities. The more information that these specific maps have, the more the gradient map is going to have to play around with color sampling. So. Basically, the more information you could throw into um, your height, uh, the more information that the gradient map will get out of it. So I'm gonna start plugging this stuff in just so I can quickly see where our color is headed. So I'm doing a lot of sampling off screen. Um, so I had a bunch of different reference images um, of different colors, and I'm just using the color picker within the gradient map to get some different colors. Um, early on, I basically like blocking in the different colors and blending them in between each other with different masks and different blend modes to try to get something that's a little bit unique here. So here I'm just playing with some of that stuff. And early on, I'm going to start grabbing mass again, similar to how we are grabbing mass for the flood fill when we are creating the stones. I'm going to start utilizing those again for the color maps. So this guy in particular has a bunch of different grayscale values. So this is going to give me a nice variation of stone values. So um, I'm using that HSL to bring some of the stone values uh, up a little bit. So you'll notice right there in the in the color and the albedo, some of the stones have gotten a little bit brighter while some either stay darker or in the same place. I take this HSL and do uh, a little bit of value adjustments here. A little, go a little bit darker. And again, I'm doing um, another pass, but this time I'm doing almost like a little spec pass. So I use the Dirt 01 to get a really granular fine detailing into the albedo. So uh, that's where that's doing that there. And then um, I do grab a, a specific node from I believe it was substance share called get slope get slope um, works in a similar fashion as some of the matte caps do in ZBrush where it gets you a nice highlights so I love using this specific node it's not one that comes with substance so make sure you just download it if you're ever looking for it but I use it as a mask to plug into my highlights area and I can mess with the color from there so it gives me some nice clean um, highlights right on the edges of the brick or any of the forms there. So it just gives me that extra little detail I'm looking for on the on the stones there. So here I'm just doing my basic grunge passes here. Um, this is where I'm basically just adding some sort of uh, different values and different um, noises onto the actual stones to break up the surface the surface a little bit. Um, so here I'm messing with the grunge map and I'm doing the same thing that I did earlier with um, plugging in the 
the the grunge map into a tile sampler to break up the lichen i'm doing that same thing but i'm just using a shape splatter and here i'm doing a vector warp grayscale to break up the grunge so it only shows up or sorry so it shows up on different stones at different valleys here so now plugging this in we kind of see what we got going on here So one thing I like to do in my albedo pass, I really like using a substances a dirt node. So the dirt node creates basically a mask once you have connected the normal, your curvature smooth and ambient occlusion. And it, it gives you a black and white mask to use as dirt. For this instance though, I inverted the dirt uh, to get me a, a different mask that I can use as a moss mask. So instead, instead of the dirt going into the crevices, because I inverted this specific mask, it's actually going to highlight the um, areas on top of the surfaces. So because of that, I'm actually putting the moss on top of the stones here. So I'm going back into some of those colors that I uh, originally gradients uh, sampled. And you, here you can see where this specific color is coming through here. And now our our stones are getting more of that greenery and more of that mossy look here. So moving forward, uh, I'm just grabbing and naming everything, making sure everything is nice and clean. And I'm going to do another grunge pass here. So taking a different noise and running it through a vector warp grayscale and just overlaying a, a brighter color here just to try to get some sort of variation onto each stone. So when I'm doing the color pass on these guys, I basically want a similar... I'm, I'm handling it similarly to how I was doing the noise on the stones where I'm taking the flood fills, I'm taking the vector warps, and I'm just offsetting them ever so slightly so every single stone gets some sort of uniqueness to them um, i want them to feel like they're coming from the same biome but also get some sort of uniqueness to each different stone here so again going back to some of those flood fills and here i'm actually doing a value pass so um, some stones are getting darker some stones are staying lighter um, and so forth uh, here I noticed that um, at this point within the material I was noticing that uh, there wasn't a lot of color variation happening So what I did was I went all the way back to the very beginning of one of the flood fills and I created a new mask And I just sampled some different colors from uh, another reference image that gives me a little bit more organic colors So before there were all these like cools and grays with this one I kind of went with a more warmer tone to it. So it breaks up um, the surface and it brings in some of those warmer tones so I have a little bit of the rock still staying in the cooler tones but now with those new uh, colors I sampled they're going in a little bit with um, just some warmer tones there and this is where I went back grabbed the lichen mask leveled it out and now I'm actually using it to apply onto this material here so um, on the gradient for the lichen, I j again, just sampled something off screen on a reference image with colors that I liked and, um, yeah. Adding the blend here. So I more or less am done with the, um, with the albedo for the stones. Um, this is where I'm actually going to start bringing in the dirt here. So with the dirt, similar to how um, I did the stones with those utilities where I grabbed the ambient occlusion and the high pass grayscale, I'm going to still use those. But instead of actually connecting the final output of what we had for our height, I actually went back and only connected the final output for our dirt. So it's before our actual height blend. That way I don't get any weird... Um, any weird things coming into our dirt information that I don't want. So I didn't essentially want the stone like shapes coming into our dirt colors or anything like that. So I made sure to basically isolate just the dirt shapes and use those for our gradients here. So similar methods here. I'm just sampling off screen some of the colors I liked on some of the reference images. And I'm basically blocking out my colors here. Um, getting some more of the browner dirts or browner colors you'd see in dirt and just breaking that a little bit up um, with some of the masks that I use to create some of the height variation. 
So there you saw me go all the way back to the very beginning of the dirt and I grabbed one of the masks that I used to create some of those like larger forms in the dirt. And I'm just using that as a mask to get some uh, color variation with different uh, hue values here. Making sure everything is named accordingly and framed because we want to make sure our graph is nice and neat here. Cool. So this is where we're actually going to start bringing in a lot of the information from our scan data or I believe, yeah, our scan data. So um, from here, I'm actually going back to our beginning of our stones. And one thing that um, you'll notice is that the shape splatter has a few different outputs um, that we didn't utilize. So this is where we're actually going to utilize those guys. Um, we, when we use the shape splatter, we're only worried about, you know, splattering the height information, but the nice thing about the shape splatter is similar to how the height blend gives you a mask. Uh, the shape splatter also gives you a mask to tell you where exactly these stones apply were applied or whatever shape you splattered. It gives you a nice mask to isolate those specific areas, which is really awesome. So now here, um, I'm basically adding just my color block ins for the different stones that I utilized at the very beginning. Um, I believe these are the stones th that weren't scans. These were just the ones that I authored within Substance um, using uh, some of the earlier methods. Just using a, a basic color block in um, and continuing uh, down the line there. So going here, um, just more of the stone work here. I'm looking and trying to see which stones are next within the the color pass here. Um, one thing you'll notice is that it's pretty it, it's pretty like um, I'm doing the same things over and over again here, where I'm actually copying the same um, three sets of nodes. There, I'm doing the gradient map, the blend, and then the threshold because that's actually going to give me. Um, the mass that I need to set for the colors. And I'm just continuing to doing this throughout the entire process of the dirt albedo. It's pretty streamlined. Um, and I almost like to think of it in a sense of, again, I'm going back to layering similar to how you would layer in Photoshop. So I like to build my albedo the same way I'm building my height map is I go back and I start adding the colors based on how I layered these guys within the height map. So um, because I did the stones first, uh, the ones that I created in substance, I did those color block ins first. And now this is where we're actually grabbing the color information from the actual stones um, from the scans. Now, one thing to note here is that there's an extra added node here called shape splatter color blend, where again, we can actually grab the information from the shape splatter that tells us where these stones were laid out um, in in particular and you can also correspond the pattern number to it so depending on wh which rock you splattered it's actually going to know where the color information needs to align to um, be perfectly matched there so super nice um, little method there just plugging all these guys in creating my masks um, and again, streamline doing the exact same thing here over and over again. I'm just doing an HSL because I do want to offset these colors ever so slightly in case that the scan data is, is either too light or too bright. Like there, I actually brought them in a little bit brighter. So always, again, just because you have the, the, the scan and it comes with these specific colors, they might not necessarily work for what you're looking for. So I always like adding some sort of utilities with HSL to break that up and um, give you a little bit more control. So um, here I'm just doing the twigs, same sort of process here, using that shape splatter uh, blend color node, getting the colors plugged in and then getting the mask. And again, just going from the bottom and then going all the way to the right side. So I like to do that with my graphs is I'll grab the specific connection points and just bring them all the way down and all the way to the right. It keeps my gr graphs nice and clean and it's just easier for me to read. So here I'm, I actually blended both of those elements together here so we can start seeing this sort of stuff coming together now, combining the albedos here. So here I'm actually going back 
and I'm gonna grab some of these uh, shape splatter nodes, the blend ones, just because I didn't want to reuse them or I didn't want to create new ones. So I just went ahead and just copied those, save some time. But here's actually, I'm doing the same method that I was doing with all the dirt stuff, but now I'm doing the grass stuff. And the reason I'm adding these elements after the fact is because just similar to how I added these elements after the fact of combining them after the height information, I'm doing the same thing with the color map. So, um, just going in and again making it i'm building the albedo similar to how i'm building the height map i just want to make it one to one so if i basically blended something after i combine my elements i'm going to grab the colors after i combine my albedos so just working in a streamlined process just because it'll it'll make you less confused with how big your graph is getting and uh it just keeps it a, a lot cleaner in this sense instead of like basically plugging in these colors randomly throughout the graph it, it might also just affect um where this stuff is being layered so you might not get the best result doing it any other way really again um at this point um i actually am pretty happy with how things are and this is where I'm actually going to grab a moss scan here. So the moss scan and the scattering of it, I'm doing a little bit differently. So before I was actually breaking up everything and splitting all these atlases up, uh, for this instance, I'm using uh, one of their nodes called, I believe it's the Atlas Scatter. And the Atlas Scatter is cool because you can actually plug in all your final maps and plug in a scan and it's gonna scatter every single element. So it's gonna scatter like your color, your normal, your height and all that. And it's gonna just blend seamlessly. The one thing about these to watch out for that I've just, I've um, ran into is that these tend to be a little bit more expensive in the sense of like milliseconds. Uh, I found my machine starts to chug a little bit more when I'm using these guys as opposed to splitting out exactly which elements you want so for example like you're using six different moss patterns here if you were to use the um the earlier method where i'm just splitting off and choosing maybe a couple in particular and even just choosing which maps i want it saves a little bit of computing time in that sense so just something to look out for but the cool thing is it's got all the same um parameters that you would find in the shape splatter so um really nice to see everything just update in general i didn't use this one too much and i believe i only used it like twice um i just knew that if i used the atlas scatter it was just going to chug of this whole material a lot more so just something to note there again masking these out um and again like i mentioned um because it affects all your different maps it has a few extra features so you can actually change the color of the moss in here and everything so instead of having to like bring in your own HSL or something like that. Um, it has those features already plugged into the Atlas scatter here. So um, could save you a little bit of just headache with all the different nodes you have. So moving forward, um, once I had the moss, I wanted to add some uh, leaf scans. So same thing, leaf scans off are, are off Adobe uh, Substance Source. So just using the same method that we did for the moss. I'm doing the scatter method um, just because I wanted to see everything uh, all together. And with this guy, I actually um, only did like a few leaves. I didn't want it to get too noisy. Um, I was running into instances where the leaves were, the more leaves I added, it was just getting way too noisy. But again, um, play with the different values and the amount you might, you guys might get different results than I do. So something to play around with there. So just messing with the smooth conform background, the conform the background. Those are nice sliders to play around with because those are the ones that are actually going to help whatever shape you're blending in to um, conform to the shape underneath. It's similar method that I go over with the pre blurs and then the using the add onto the blends earlier. Like so for the lichen, um, it, it's basically that similar method is just baked into this one specific uh, node here. So cool little thing there so next up um once i had all the elements i pretty much am going into the final stages here um 
this was almost an afterthought. Um, I wanted to see what it would look like, the material would look like with water. So uh, it's really easy to add water to your materials um, because Substance has introduced, uh, well, I wouldn't say introduced, um, it's, it has a water level node that I like to use a lot of the times. So if you've already finished your whole material and you just want to see what it would look like wet or with puddles, this is a great node to try out. Um, I didn't want it to get too reflective, so I only did like just a little bit um, puddles here and there. And uh, just plugged it in and see the results there. So here I'm coming to my final uh, sort of post-process stuff here. I'm doing curvature um, passes on my material here. I'm doing that by grabbing the normal and doing curvature smooth and curvature sobel, sobel. Uh, blending them into each other and using a gradient map. The reason I use a gradient map is because these curvatures are coming out as grayscale outputs. To blend it into a color albedo map, you actually have to create that grayscale into a um, RGB node. So had to use that there. Cool. So now I'm going back, just naming everything accordingly, uh, framing everything just so we can keep it nice and clean. And this is where we're going to start our process of creating our roughness map. So to begin, I'm just going to do a grayscale conversion with um, some of the color block out I did for my stone shapes and then do a levels. Um, this is essentially the, the first couple of nodes that you're creating with your roughness are more or less the effect that you want on your material. So, I did that levels and you'll notice that it's mostly on a on a, the white, almost brighter white values there is because I want the stones to feel a little bit more matte and not as reflective. There, there's still going to be some opportunity to add that reflection or reflectivity later down the line as I'm building the, um, the roughness because I am starting to take all the grunges and all the different passes with the color values that I did in my albedos. So just something to note there, it's going to be a fine balance of tweaking all the stuff that you're adding with the stuff that you did in your albedo with uh, the really early um, color values that you choose at the beginning for your roughness here. And again, this is this is pretty streamlined here. Um, I'm basically taking the exact same connections and the exact same mass that I used for my albedo to add all the different variations, all the different color values all the different grunges, um, and I'm just using these specific connections, plugging them in. And for the roughness, I either use a black or a white because I can control the opacity and the value within the blend, or sometimes I go into the uniform color and change it to like a gray or something. So here you can kind of see me uh, just plugging stuff in here and messing with the different opacities. Uh, I Throughout the whole process of the roughness, I do name everything just because I don't want to get lost of what's going on and what I'm doing. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the albedo and I'm basically just grabbing the exact same connection based on where it is above the roughness node network. So now that I have the stones all set, uh, I'm going to do the exact same things with uh, the dirt. I'm just going to run it through a grayscale conversion to get that first value and I'm gonna run it through a levels to control that value a little bit better. So similar to how the stones are, um, these specific values that you start off with are gonna determine a lot of how reflective the dirt is gonna be. So something to keep in mind there. Um, I also made sure to connect it early on just because before I didn't have anything connected there. Um, next up, I'm gonna start blending in some of the other elements Similar to how we were doing with the stones and looking right above to find the connections. I'm just doing that again with the dirt. I tend to do this a lot with my materials is I build the albedos and I try to keep it on the same highway, like right underneath. That way it's just easy for me to grab the same connection points. So you notice as I go through the graph that I'm just grabbing the same connection points that are from the mass for the different elements. And I'm just plugging these guys in and choosing different roughness values here making sure everything is named accordingly and making sure everything is tied into the same names as the albedo that way. Uh, if I ever need to go back and reference where something is, I don't get lost in the node network or anything like that. So again, 
just messing with the different blend modes and the different opacities. Um, play around with the different blend modes because they might give you um, some different results as far as the intensity of some of these roughness values I have been finding out. So, um, you know, you might not necessarily need to change the uniform color to a certain way if you were to change the blend mode on some of these blends. So again, uh, just streamline here, continuing forward through the entire um, highway of the roughness map. Um, some of the scans here, again, you're not conformed to some of the roughness values of the scans that you're given. You can always go in and change that sort of stuff. So that's what I like working with just the substance stuff is it's, you know, um, non-destructive. And even though, um, even though the scan comes with a predefined, like accurate, uh, roughness value, uh, sometimes when it's working together with your material, it might not be necessarily the right one for an art direction purpose. And there you have it. So this is pretty much the final result for your material. Uh, I'm just going around and doing the different, um, uh, primitives just so I can kind of see it in different shapes and forms um, making sure to save my file and yeah I hope you enjoyed this tutorial thank you to everybody at view conference for having me on really enjoyed it and I'll see you guys in the next one peace